Good morning, church family. How's it going today? I got a couple of goods. That's great. Let's stand. We'll begin in singing. If you're online, thank you for joining. 
You join and sing wherever you are. We put our hands together this morning. Our praise awaits you at the dawn. Our praise awaits you with the dawn. Our souls awake to you and lift a song. We've seen the things, we've seen the things that you have done. And still we know the best is yet to come. There's more to come. So open the gates, let's sing. Let's open the gates. to shine Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing But this joy is mine So with a thousand hallelujahs so With a thousand hallelujahs We magnify your name It's you alone deserve the glory Honor and the praise, Lord Jesus. This song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs, a thousand more. Who 
else would die for our redemption. Whose resurrection means our eyes. There isn't time enough to sing of all you've done. But I have eternity to try. So with a thousand. says, then let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to the Lord. And specifically talking about praise with our lips, that we would acknowledge his name. And I think that word continually is kind of the key word there. It's not easy for me to do that. Things like paying the bills and sitting in traffic don't really elicit continually acknowledging the name of God, right? Imagine some of you feel that way too, hopefully. But that is what we're to do. And that's what this song is about, that the, we would praise the Lord, that we would lift a thousand hallelujahs in a lifetime. So let's sing this next section as a confession and as a commitment that we would sing to the Lord continually, that we would acknowledge his name continually. Let's sing praise to the Lord. This God we do. We sing praise. The Lord to the Lamb, He will sing of heaven His praise. For He rose, now He reigns, now He reigns.
a thousand more. Yes, God, that is our confession today. We praise you.
praise you, we thank you. Praise you, we thank you. Yes, we praise you. It's your breath in our lungs. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour. thank you so much for the opportunity to be a church family to worship you in song to lift up truths that our God is good that he is faithful that the sacrifice that was made on our behalf is way bigger than we could ever deserve so we acknowledge that you are a good God now we're here to serve you Lord, help us to learn something new today. Help the word to pierce each of our hearts. We want to grow in you. We want to worship you. So we say that Jesus is at the center. We invite your Holy Spirit to speak to us and to just take control over the whole rest of the morning, Lord. God, we thank you for your goodness, that you're near to us, that you are at work in our church family. Pray all these things in Christ's name and everybody said, amen, amen. You guys, thank you so much for singing. It's a treat for me to be up here with you guys, so you can go ahead and take your seat now. Good morning, friends. Welcome to Revive Church. My name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here, and if you're visiting this morning, we are really glad you're here, and I want to welcome you in Jesus' name. Now, I don't know where you're at in your spiritual journey, but what I do know is this, there's a God in heaven, and he works in the backgrounds of our lives to position us so that we will hear different spiritual truths about him at different times. It was true in my life. It's true in the life of the people in this room. It's true in your life. And so God's not surprised that you're here. He's got something special for you. Open your heart to him and just say, God, if you're real, then, then you do something today special in my life. And you just watch and see what God does. Hey, as we look in the calendar really quick, we got a guest lunch coming up May 15th. That's the next step. If you're a guest, you haven't come to one of those, uh, Jerry and I want to meet you. We want to introduce you to some of the staff. Plan to join us for that May 15th. Uh, young adults, we've got Trinity Nights coming up. Listen, Pastor Nate and I had lunch this week. He went through his notes with me. It's going to be amazing. You're going to want to grab some friends because you're going to be talking about the character of God, the very nature of the triune Godhead. It's going to be, uh, it's going to blow your mind. Uh, when you think about the greatness of our God. 
Hey guys, I wanna invite you to the men's retreat. Space is limited. Friends are already flying in, guys, from other parts of the country. Uh, if you've got a son 14 or older, I wanna encourage you to bring him. We're gonna be using the man code as kind of our overarching study. And then I'm gonna be sharing in some little breakout sessions just different things that you and I need to be thinking about as men, trying to care for our family and friends, the people that we have the most influence of, of protecting, caring, encouraging. Uh, listen, we are living in some like really crazy times and it's gonna get crazier before it gets better. But what I know is this, is that God's planning on using you. So let's get together the men's retreat and uh, let's seek the Lord and see what God has and the strengthening of our hands for the days in which we live. Now this morning, I've invited a very good friend of mine, Pastor Jason Carlson. He pastors Lakes E. Free uh, um, up in Lindstrom. Uh, we, we have lunch together on a regular basis. We have dinner together, our wives, and get together, four of us, and, and we've traveled together, we've fished together. He's ministered to my soul, and so I know he's gonna minister to your soul. That's why I brought him this morning. But not only is he pastoring, but he travels around the country, lectures in colleges, uh, on the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. He spent much of his life defending the Christian faith, that Jesus is unique. He's not just a person in history. Um, he's not just a teacher. He's not just a prophet. No, he is the Son of God. So your hearts are going to be blessed. He's speaking in all three services this morning. And then tonight he's coming back, going to be sharing with us at 6 o'clock and then doing a Q&A afterwards. So grab some family, friends. Listen, if you've got students you got college students, high school students, junior high students, you need to bring them tonight. If you got family members and you know they've kind of like walked away from the faith and they don't really you know think a whole lot of the Bible, the, the church, the gospel, uh, Jesus, I'm just telling you, if you can invite them tonight, maybe God would stir their hearts and they'd be here. And I'm going to tell you, Jason is going to minister to their souls. Well, hey, at this time, let's welcome Pastor Jason. Thank you so much. Man, it's so great to be here at Revive this morning. Uh, your pastor, Pastor Mark, is one of my best friends, and it is just a real privilege to be here uh, and to share with you today. Uh, as Pastor Mark mentioned, I'm a senior pastor at a fellow free church in Lindstrom, Minnesota, uh, Lakes Free Church. I've been there for 14 years, uh, four years as senior pastor. But uh, I'm also involved in an apologetics ministry uh, that was founded by my father, Dr. Ron Carlson, back in 1975. And uh, in our apologetics ministry, we get the uh, privilege of traveling all over the world, speaking and teaching on uh, reasons for why we believe what we believe as followers of Jesus Christ and equipping Christians to have answers for their faith. And that's our goal here on this Apologetic Sunday at Revive. Uh, the word apologetics is a Greek word. It means apo it's, it's a apologia. It means to give a defense. And that's what we're about here today. We're going to give a defense this morning for the uniqueness of Jesus Christ in a world of religions. What, what is so unique? What is so special about Jesus Christ? And then tonight, I want to invite you guys back at 6 o'clock. 6 to 8 tonight, we're going to have a great time looking at the reality of uh, where we are in our post-Christian culture today. Where are, we, where are we at? How did we get here? And then how can we as Christians respond to some of the, the cultural challenges that we're facing? It's going to be a great session tonight. We're going to have an opportunity for some question and answers. So I really uh, hope uh, you'll join us and want to encourage you to be a part of that with us. But this morning, what we're going to be doing here today is following the Apostle Peter's admonition in 1 Peter 3.15. Peter says that as followers of Jesus Christ, we are to be ready always, prepared to give an answer, a reason for the hope that we have when anybody asks us. And so today, specifically, we're going to look at the question of the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. What is so unique? What is so special about Jesus Christ, different from every other religion in the world? I've had the privilege over the last 25 years of living, traveling, and lecturing in over 30 countries on six continents. And uh, in these experiences, I've had some unique opportunities to see and witness what it is that is so special and so unique about Jesus, different from every other religion, every other culture, every other philosophy. This morning, I want to encourage you over the next few minutes to just try to forget for a little while that we're here in Brooklyn Park at Revive Church, and I want to invite you to come with me on a tour of the world's religions. I want to take you with me to see and experience some of the things that, that God's allowed me to see and experience for the purpose of hopefully becoming more sure 
in our faith and in the reality that there is something very unique and special, different about Jesus from every other religion, every other philosophy. You know, it never ceases to amaze me no matter where I go, teaching, lecturing, I do a lot, of, uh, a lot of stuff on college campuses around the country and all over the world. But no matter where I go, it always seems that one question in particular is always asked. In fact, I was speaking at the University of Minnesota recently, and during the Q&A session, a young man stood up and he asked me this very question. He said, Mr. Carlson, tell me something. Why are you Christians always sending missionaries overseas? He says, why don't you just leave people alone? He says, people are happy. They got their own cultures, their own religions. And then he said, tell me something. What is so special and unique about Jesus that you feel it necessary to send missionaries all over the world? Well, friends, that's a very interesting question. And it's probably one of the most important questions that any of us could ask this morning. What is so special, what is so unique about Jesus Christ that we feel compelled to go to the ends of the earth to share the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ? Well, this morning, I want to explore that question. And again, to do this, I want to take you with me on a a tour of the world's religions. I had the privilege of living and traveling throughout Southeast Asia. And I wish I could take you with me to one of the many refugee camps found throughout Southeast Asia. Refugee camps left over from numerous wars, famines, natural disasters. Places where people have been displaced from their homes and are forced to live in in makeshift houses and tents and dwellings. If we were to go, for example, to a, a typical refugee camp on the border of Thailand and Myanmar, like the one my father visited recently before his death. He was visiting some friends there working on the border of Thailand and Myanmar, and as he walked through this refugee camp, remember he was in the Buddhist country of Thailand in a refugee camp filled with thousands of Buddhist refugees. As he walked through this camp, right away he began to notice something very curious, very puzzling. Here in this Buddhist country of Thailand in a refugee camp with tens of thousands of Buddhist refugees, it became quickly apparent to him that there were no Buddhists there in that refugee camp taking care of their Buddhist brothers and sisters. As he walked around, he he quickly realized that there weren't any Hindus there taking care of the people in their poverty and desperation. There weren't any Muslims there taking care of these people. In fact, the only people in that refugee camp caring for these refugees, want to know who they were? They were all Christians. Christian mission organizations, Christian relief organizations, groups like World Vision and Compassion and Samaritan's Purse. But it was only Christians that were there caring for these refugees. My father thought that this was very interesting, and so he asked the man who was in charge of all the relief work in that region of Thailand, he he said to him, sir, tell me something. Why, in this Buddhist country of Thailand, in a refugee camp filled with thousands of Buddhist refugees, why are there no Buddhists here taking care of their Buddhist brothers and sisters? And the man's response was fascinating. He said to my dad, Ron... Have you ever seen what Buddhism does to a nation or a people? And he went on to explain that Buddha taught that man is to be an island unto himself. Buddha taught that if somebody is suffering, you are not to interfere with their suffering because they are suffering in this life as a result of their bad karma from a previous life. And now they must suffer in this life in order to purge themselves of their bad karma so they might somehow be reborn into a better state in the next life. But Buddha said you are not to interfere with another person's suffering. Man is to be an island unto himself. See, friends, the only people who had any reason to be there in that refugee camp caring for those refugees were Christians. Christians who understood the value of human life. Christians who understood that those men and women were so loved and so valuable to God 
that God 2,000 years ago took on flesh and became a man and went to the cross to give his life out of love for each and every one of them so that they could have the hope of reconciliation with their creator God. And the reality is you find this basis for love and compassion, this value for human life and no other religion and no other philosophy apart from biblical Christianity and the person of Jesus Christ. Dr. A.W. Tozer, in his classic work, The Knowledge of the Holy, he makes an interesting comment in the introduction to his book. He says this, The history of mankind will positively demonstrate that no society or people has ever risen above its religion. And man's history will show that no religion is ever greater than its concept of God. Now, what was Dr. Tozer saying? What Dr. Tozer was saying there is simply this. What a person thinks and believes about God. What you think and believe about God this morning will directly impact every other area of your life. What you think and believe about God, it will determine your value for human life. It will determine your basis for morality. It will even determine your standard of living. And I wish I could take you with me around the world this morning because we would be able to quickly discover what it is that is so unique about Jesus Christ and biblical Christianity and the difference that the Christian worldview produces in a person's everyday life, apart from all the other religions and philosophies in the world. If we could go, for example, this morning to that great subcontinent of Asia, the nation of India. Friends, do you know that the nation of India today has a greater population than all of Africa, South America, and Australia combined? That one country has more people than all three of those continents combined. Over a one and a quarter billion people alive in the nation of India today. And in India, the dominant religion is known as what? Hinduism. And in Hinduism, the basic philosophy is what is called monism and pantheism. Monism is the belief that everything is one, everything is spiritually connected, and pantheism is the belief that everything is God. So everything is God and everything is one. That's basic Hindu philosophy. Now, in the quote we just read from Dr. Tozer, Dr. Tozer says that what a person thinks and believes about God will directly influence every other aspect of their life. Now, I want you to think with me for a moment this morning about that statement in regards to Hindu philosophy. If everything is one and everything is God, if the stars are God, and the clouds are God, and the trees are God, and your pet dog at home is God, and the dirt is God, and you are God, think about that. If the dirt is God, and you are God, what do you become equal with? With dirt. And you see, this has historically been one of the fundamental problems in the nation of India. India, because of its Hindu worldview, has never been able to raise the level of nature to the level of men and women. Instead, what you find in Hinduism is men and women are often devalued to the level of nature. We saw a dramatic example of this this past year during the COVID outbreak in India. The Hindu gurus in India, you want to know what their solution was to the COVID outbreak? They advocated smearing your body in cow dung and drinking cow urine in order to ward off the virus. Hinduism often devalues men and women to the lowest levels of nature. In recent years, major news outlets have reported that India annually produces enough grain to feed its entire population and have enough left over to sell and export on the world market. But friends, do you know that this last year, the United Nations reported that over one-third of India's grain crop was eaten by rats? 
Do you know that they estimate that today in India there are three times more rats than the population? Over three billion rats. We're not talking about mice. We're talking about rats the size of your cat at home. I don't know, maybe you saw the Discovery Channel special recently on the rats in India. They're everywhere. And these rats annually eat upwards of one-third of India's grain crop. But you see, because of their Hindu worldview, the Hindus will not kill the rats because they might be somebody's reincarnated uncle or aunt. And so the children often starve to death in the streets. See, friends, as you go around the world, you quickly discover that most of the world's problems are not simply economical or technological. Instead, what you'll find is that the majority of the world's problems are basic spiritual problems based on what a person thinks and believes about God. Now, the ultimate goal in Hinduism is to purge yourself of bad karma, seeking to become one with the impersonal universe they call God. If we were to go to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia this morning, we could observe the Hindus in this process. The first thing we would watch at, 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 at uh, the famous Batu Caves there in Kuala Lumpur, the first thing we would watch is as the Hindus go into a yoga-induced meditative trance. They, they take on a zombie-like stare. The Hindus then take their tongues and they pull their tongues out of their mouth as far as they can stretch them and they take long sharp skewers like knitting needles and they jab them down through their tongue so they cannot pull it back into their mouths. The Hindus then take another long 12-inch skewer and they stick it through their cheeks and out the other side. We would then watch as the Hindus take long, eight-foot-long, heavy-weighted metal poles with chains hanging off the ends of them, with large fishing hooks on them. And the Hindus will dig these poles and these hooks into their flesh on the front and on the back of their bodies. And as the weight of these metal poles tears at their flesh, the Hindus are required to climb 272 steps up to the entrance of the Batu Caves where they bow down and worship the idol of the python the serpent, the snake, seeking to gain penance and forgiveness so that they might somehow become one with the impersonal universe they call God. But as I've shared with countless people involved in Eastern philosophy and the New Age movement, the problem is, friends, an impersonal universe never loved or cared about anybody. Only a personal creator could love and care for his creation. If we were to go this morning to the Middle East or North Africa, we'd find there the religion known as Islam. Islam is the religion, Muslims or Muslims are the people, Muhammad is their prophet, and Allah is their God. If we were to go to the Muslim world this morning, we would immediately notice two things. The first thing we would notice would be a culture radically different from what we know here in the West. You see, Muhammad, the founder of Islam, what he did was he basically deified the 7th century Arabian culture of his day, turning those 7th century Arabian cultural norms into the laws of Allah that are found in the Quran. And because of this, Islam is religiously compelled to impose its 7th century Arabian cultural values upon all other aspects of life. Political expression, family affairs, dietary laws, clothing, religious rights, language, on and on. All of these things come directly out of the 7th century Arabian culture that Muhammad deified, turning them into the laws of Allah in the Quran. And Muslims today are religiously compelled to impose this 7th century Arabian culture upon all, all other cultures of the world. The word Islam literally means submission. Submission to the will of Allah. And as a result of this, Islam is a fundamentally intolerant religion. It's very interesting, even this morning driving here to Revive, I came to an intersection here in Brooklyn Park, and the car in front of me at the red light had a bumper sticker on the back of it. The bumper sticker read, Coexist! And the word coexist was spelled out in different religious symbols. 
The sea was the crescent moon of Islam. What a popular idea in our world today. You know, what if we could just all get along? Maybe if we just all coexisted, we'd have peace and harmony. It's interesting, though, friends, when you study the religion of Islam, there is no such thing as free and peaceful coexistence in the religion of Islam. In fact, when you read the Quran, what you discover is the Prophet Muhammad divided the world into two distinct categories. The Dar al-Islam, the house of Islam, and the Dar al-Harb, the house of war. And so Muhammad in the Quran says that you are either a Muslim or you are at war with Islam, but there is no notion of free and peaceful coexistence within the religion of Islam. It's fundamentally intolerant of every other religion, every other culture. In fact, it's interesting, if you were to read the Quran, what you'll discover is that within the Quran there are 109 war verses. 109 verses advocating the killing of Jews, Christians, and other infidels who disagree with the teachings of Muhammad. One out of every 55 verses in the Quran is an admonition to Muslims to kill Jews, Christians, and other infidels. Friends, do you think that that would distort your religious worldview if every 55 verses you came across in your Bible was a command to kill somebody who disagreed with your religion? And we wonder why young men are signing up all over the world to be suicide bombers and jihadi warriors, especially when Allah says that that is the only guaranteed path to salvation in Islam, is to die in holy war for Muhammad and Allah. Islam, friends, is a fundamentally intolerant religion. Prophet Muhammad himself personally ordered or led 73 attacks against non-Muslim people. It's a very different example from who we know in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who laid down his life to bring forgiveness to the world. Second thing we would notice if we were to travel to the Middle East this morning would be a widespread fatalism that permeates everyday life throughout the Muslim world. Muslim fatalism is the belief that all of the God of Islam is a God of sheer power who wills and determines everything. Human beings have no free choice. And Allah is capricious by nature. What that means is He can change His mind. His his word cannot be trusted. And so this produces a widespread fatalism throughout the Islamic world. I'll never forget when I was in Cairo, Egypt, visiting some missionary friends. They, they took me on a tour walking through Cairo along the banks of the Nile River. Cairo is one of the largest cities in the world. And right through the heart of Cairo flows the Nile River, this dirty, filthy, polluted river. All along the banks of the Nile River are thousands of people who live in little squatter shacks and shanty towns. People making homes out of cardboard and scrap metal and tin roofs, whatever they can get their hands on. I remember walking along the banks of the Nile River and we came across a man with a large five-gallon pail dipping it into the water to get drinking water for his family. Now that wasn't so bad except for the fact that 10 yards upstream there was another man with his pants down urinating into the water. Well, we said to this man with the bucket, we said, Sir, you can't drink that water. Don't you know you're going to get amoeba, dysentery, hepatitis, cholera, you know, something, right? Right? And with that fatalistic stare that's so common throughout the Muslim world, he looked up at the sky and he said, whatever Allah wills. If I live, it's Allah's will. If I die, it's Allah's will. Allah wills and determines everything. Man has no choice. See, friends, this is the dominant attitude in the Muslim world. If Allah wills and determines everything, what reason do men and women have to try and better their situation in life? Islamic fatalism also stems from the fact that Allah is an unknowable God. The Muslim cannot know God personally. They can only know the laws of Allah given in the Quran. And this is why if you ever hear a Muslim pray, when a Muslim goes to prayer five times a day, do you know what they pray? They pray, God have mercy on me. And the reason a Muslim pleads for mercy five times a day is because they do not know the grace of God. 
They do not know that God is our heavenly Father who loves us so much that he sent his Son to die for us so that we could be forgiven of our sins and reconciled to him in a right relationship. Instead, the Muslim is taught in the Quran that on the day of judgment, Allah is going to weigh their good and bad deeds in a balancing scale. But you see, the Muslims never quite sure they're doing enough good deeds to outweigh the bad deeds, and so they beg for mercy five times a day. God, have mercy on me. Such hopelessness, friends. Such hopelessness. We could go around the world. One of the basic religions we find in both sophisticated and primitive societies is the religion known as animism. Animism is the belief that spirits animate or indwell nature. They live in the rocks, the trees, the rivers. And these spirits will either help you or harm you depending on how you relate to them. I wish I could take you with me this morning to a typical animistic tribe. If we were to go, for example, down to Irian Jaya, next to Papua New Guinea, and visit the Dani people. If we were to walk into a typical Dani village this morning, you'd all notice something immediately. The first thing you'd notice is that very few of the women in that village have fingers. See, whenever somebody dies in that village, the women are each required to take a machete and chop off another finger at the knuckle, seeking to appease the evil spirits in nature. If we were to go next door to the island nation of Papua New Guinea and visit the Korowai people, you better hope that no one dies while we're in a typical Korowai village because when somebody dies, the village goes on a witch hunt to find the person who is responsible for cursing the deceased individual. They'll go on a witch hunt to decide who in the village is responsible, who, who cursed the person who died. When they discover that person, they'll bash in their skull, they'll place their body up on a bamboo rack, let it rot in the hot, humid sun for three days. On the fourth day, when the flesh is rotted and the maggots are crawling all over it, the people of the village are each required to line up and eat the flesh and the maggots until they vomit for days afterwards seeking to rid the evil presence from their village. Oh, it doesn't matter what you believe. All religions are basically the same. Friends, you ever heard somebody say something like that before? You want to know that this is one of the most common statements I hear on university campuses today? Students and faculty, they say, oh, it doesn't matter what you believe. All religions are basically the same. Friends, I'm going to let you in on a little secret this morning. The next time you hear somebody say something like that, you will know immediately that you have met somebody who is totally naive. Not only naive, but ignorant. Ignorant of history, philosophy, anthropology, religion. See, the reality is all religions are not basically the same. And there is something very unique this morning about biblical Christianity and the person of Jesus Christ, different from every other religion, every other philosophy in the world. Our family has a good friend by the name of Lou. Lou grew up in the nation of Thailand. He's from a devout Buddhist family. Grew up in a devout Buddhist family, and when Lou was in his early 20s, Lou received a scholarship to come here and study at the university. While Lou was here at the university, he was befriended by a group of Christians on campus. Over the course of a couple of years, Lou eventually renounced his Buddhist faith and put his trust in Jesus as his Savior and Lord. I wish my friend Lou was here this morning to share his testimony with us. Lou shares that when he was a Buddhist, he says, I felt like I was in the middle of a large lake and I was drowning and I didn't know how to swim. Lou says, I was doing everything I could, struggling, gasping for air, keeping my head above water. But Lou says, I was going under, I was dying. And Lou says, as I was doing everything I could to keep my head above water, I looked out on the shore of that lake 
and I saw Buddha walk up to the edge of the lake. And Buddha began yelling out to me instructions, teaching me how to swim. Buddha said, Lou, if you'll just paddle your arms and kick your legs, you'll be able to keep your head above water. You'll be able to breathe. You'll be able to swim. But Buddha said, Lou, you need to make it to shore yourself. And Lou explains that he was doing everything he could to, to follow the Buddha's teachings, to, to follow his guidance and instructions. But Buddha says, Buddha sa Lou says, I was still dying. I was drowning. I was going under. And Lou says, I was about to go under for the very last time. When once again I looked at the shore. And this time I saw Jesus Christ walk up to the edge of the lake. But Jesus didn't stop at the edge of the lake. Jesus Christ dove out into that lake and he swam out and he rescued me. And once Jesus brought me safely back to shore, then Jesus taught me how to swim so that I could go back and rescue others. See, friends, there is something very unique and special about Jesus Christ, different from every other religion in the world. What is religion? When you study the religions of the world, what you'll discover is that religion is about what men and women do to try to earn approval with God. Religion is about our good works and our rituals and our sacrifices and our money, trying to prove our worthiness to make ourselves right with the divine. But you see, the problem with religion is that men and women can never do enough in order to earn our way back to our Creator God. And this is what is so unique and special about Jesus Christ. See, Christianity is not about religion. Christianity is not about what we do to try to earn favor with God. Christianity is about what God did for us by sending His Son to die for us, to forgive us of our sins. See, the Bible tells us that each and every one of us here this morning has a fundamental problem. You know what that problem is? Well, let's do a little experiment here this morning. I, I want you to turn to the person sitting next to you. I want you to take a big whiff, all right? Go ahead, smell the person sitting next to you. Go ahead, take a big whiff. All right, let me ask you something. What'd you smell? I'll tell you what you smelled. You either smelled that person stink or you smelled something covering up their stink, right? <laughs> See, the reality is, as human beings, we stink. We all stink. We stink physically. But more seriously, we stink spiritually. Isaiah 64, 6 says that all of our righteousness is like filthy rags in the eyes of a holy God. Because of our sin, because of our stink, there's nothing we can do to earn favor with our holy, perfect creator God. And this is why God, in his great love for us, sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world to make a way through his shed blood on the cross to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us of our unrighteousness, to, to wash away our stink so that we could come back into a right relationship with him. The Apostle Paul in Romans 5, 8 says that God proved his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ came and he died for us. See, friends, this is the tremendous difference between Christianity and every other religion in the world. Religion is about what men and women do to, to try to earn favor with God, something that we can never do on our own. Christianity is about God and his amazing grace making a way for us to be washed, cleansed, forgiven, and brought into a right relationship with Him. The Apostle John, John chapter 1, verse 12, says that to all who receive Him, to those who believe in Jesus' name, He gives the right to be called children of God. Are you a child of God this morning? Do you have the assurance of knowing that you've been made right with your Creator? Who among us here wouldn't want to know that? Who among us here wouldn't want that assurance? 
Friends, you can leave here this morning knowing in full confidence that you too are a child of God if you'll simply put your hope and trust in Jesus, the one who can forgive you of your sins and bring you back into a right relationship with your creator God. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your amazing grace that you lavished upon us in your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that our hope is not based on trying to earn your approval through good works, through acts of righteousness, through sacrifices, through rituals. We don't have to strive to try to earn a place with you because you, Jesus, you made a way. You came into this world 2,000 years ago out of your great love for us and you went to the cross and you laid down your life as a sacrifice for our sin, a substitute for the death that we deserved, a death that we deserved to die. You died in our place because of your love for us. And it's through your shed blood that we can be washed and cleansed and made new. We can be called children of God because of your amazing grace. Lord, I pray that there's nobody here this morning who misses out on the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God has made a way for us through Jesus, his son and his shed blood on the cross. I pray if there's anybody here this morning who's never embraced you as their Savior and Lord, that even today they might turn to you in prayer. Even right now in the quiet of their own heart, that they might call out to you and say, Jesus, I know I've been living my life in rebellion against you. I know I'm a sinner, and I know that there is nothing that I can do of my own works to enter into your holy, perfect, righteous presence. And so, God, this morning, I need you. I need your amazing grace. I need Jesus. I need Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. Friends, I tell you this morning, God knows your heart. And if you'll simply call out to him in faith, you too can know with assurance that you are a child of God because of the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. Thank you for that, Lord. For those of us who are walking with you, who have put our hope in you, Lord Jesus, help us to live faithfully as your ambassadors in this world bringing the good news of Jesus to a world trapped in darkness, a world that so desperately needs to know the truth. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you all stand and we'll just sing one more time together to wrap things up? Sing, oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing Alleluia. Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing Alleluia. Christ is risen. Sing that again. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing Alleluia. Christ is risen. We bow down. Bow down before
that blood we do acknowledge that you alone are a good and true father creator and God Lord we thank you so much for that sacrifice we know that you are rich in mercy and love and that nothing that we could ever do would make you love us more or less God, we thank you so much for that. We worship you for that. As we leave today, would you equip us to be your hands and feet in every place that we walk? God, help us share you in every conversation and be a light. Help us to live for you alone. We pray these things in your name. Everybody said amen. Amen, you guys. Thanks for gathering today. It's so good to see all your faces. That's it for today.